Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor, and here with me is my co-host, Eric. Hello. Today we will be exploring the sinking of RMS Empress of Ireland, a Scottish ocean liner that sank in 1914. Before we dive in, we must inform you, this story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the sinking of a vessel and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note, before we begin, that neither Eleanor nor I are mariners or experts in the field of maritime history, but we have done our research and will present the information as we understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, we'll be looking at both the perspectives of witness aboard Empress of Ireland, as well as the other ship involved in the collision and sinking. Before we get started, we will go over the basics of nautical terminology. The bow is the very front part of the ship, and the very back end of it is called the stern. The port side is the left, and the starboard side is the right. Propellers are sometimes referred to as screws. The hull is the metal sides of the ship, the keel is the very bottom of it, and the superstructure is the top deck, usually made of wood. Smokestacks, or funnels, are large tunnels on top of the ship used to direct steam and smoke away from the deck. Masts are large wooden poles on the deck of the ship, usually used to hoist sails or hold a crow's nest where crew members can see for miles around the vessel. Beam is a measurement that refers to the width of the ship. Thanks, Derek. Today our story starts in Govan, a district in Glasgow, Scotland. Empress of Ireland was the younger sister in a pair of two ocean liners built for the Canadian Pacific Steamship Company for the run between Liverpool, England, and Montreal, Quebec. Before the Empress of Ireland was built, the Canadian Pacific Steamship Company bought Elder Dempster and Company in 1903 acquiring three ships from this purchase and thus launching their start in the transatlantic shipping trade. The next year, the company would expand their fleet. The two sisters, Empress of Ireland and Empress of Britain, were ordered in 1904 and the double bottom keel for Empress of Ireland was laid April 10th, 1905 next to her sister in yard number 443 in the Fairfield Shipbuilding and Engineering Company shipyard. The two identical ocean liners were designed by Francis Elgar, both clad with two funnels, two masts, and two four-bladed propellers. Empress of Ireland was 570 feet in length, had a 65.7-foot beam, and a depth of 36.7 feet. Her twin screw propellers were driven by two quadruple expansion steam engines, much like the engines found aboard RMS Titanic. Empress of Ireland had an average service speed of 18 knots fast for a ship of 14,191 gross registered tons. The ship was divided into 11 compartments with its 10 watertight bulkheads that went up to the shelter deck, the compartments being able to be sealed with 24 white watertight doors that had to be closed individually and manually, unlike the watertight doors on Titanic that could be closed from the bridge. Technically, the Empress could remain afloat with two adjacent compartments flooded. She could comfortably accommodate 310 first class, 468 second class, 494 third class, and 270 steerage class passengers for a total of 1,542 people. In 1906, the average crew was 373 men. It's interesting that Empress of Ireland was technically divided into four classes. Typically, we only see three, right? That's correct, Eleanor. Not only were her accommodations revolutionary, but after the Titanic disaster, her safety equipment was updated. Her lifeboats able to carry 1,686 people, 280 people more than her maximum capacity. People felt safe on this luxurious, comfortable ship due to the updated safety standards. The first class passengers enjoyed two fully enclosed promenade decks, a music room, a first class cafe amidships, first class smoking room, and a grand staircase similar to the staircase seen on Titanic. They also had a large, elegant first-class dining room with a separate dining room for the children. The two and four berth rooms were spacious and beautifully decorated, oozing class and wealth in every floorboard. The second-class passengers also had a bougie accommodations. They had a large open deck space at the aft end of the lower promenade deck, second-class smoking room, a beautiful staircase near the aft mast, and a large dining room that was beautiful but more average than the first classes. 
They also had a very night two and four berth cabins that could be easily transformed into first or third class cabins if need be. Third class and steerage class were mixed, with third class's cabins being just a tad nicer and more private than steerage. They had a large open space on deck with a children's sandbox, two smaller public rooms next to this large open deck, a third class smoking room, and third class dining room. The new steerage or third class cabins were more similar to second class cabins and where the old steerage cabins were open spaces filled with bunks. Wow, sounds like Empress of Ireland really thought of everything. Yeah, it was very accommodating for anyone of any class type. Empress of Ireland's class system made her career a smash hit. Two months after her eldest sister, Empress of Britain, entered the service, Empress of Ireland left Liverpool for Quebec City on her maiden voyage. She departed for this maiden voyage on a Thursday afternoon on June 29, 1906, and the following morning she docked at port in Moville, Ireland to pick up Irish immigrants before heading out to the open sea. On this maiden voyage, she carried 1,257 passengers, most of these passengers being immigrants. She was immensely popular among the immigrant class and would continue to be popular among immigrants until her sinking. On the morning of July 6, 1906, Empress of Ireland entered the mouth of the St. Lawrence River in Canada, the very tail end of the voyage. At Point au Pereire, she called for a river pilot in order to guide the ship into port. Pilot boats and tugs are often used in hazardous ports to guide ships in the safest routes to the dock. Empress of Ireland also dropped off Canadian-bound mail, hence why she would be registered as RMS Empress of Ireland, a Royal Mail Steamer. The following morning, Empress of Ireland arrived in Quebec City, unloading passengers and cargo before reloading for her first eastbound passage, departing on July 12, 1906. For the next eight years, Empress of Ireland made these same voyages dutifully, alternating Canadian ports depending upon the season. She docked at Quebec City between May and October, and in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and St. John, New Brunswick between November and April. She would make her final successful run ending on May 22, 1914, having already carried 187,100 passengers successfully both ways across the Atlantic Ocean. We have arrived at the final voyage and sinking of RMS Empress of Ireland. Just a reminder to our listeners that what we are about to discuss does detail the sinking of a vessel, and as well as death that may be disturbing to some viewers. Listener discretion is advised as we continue. After successfully stopping in Quebec City on May 22, 1914, Empress of Ireland loaded cargo and 1,057 passengers alongside 420 crew members. Among the crew is the new captain who had been promoted at the beginning of the month, Captain Henry George Kendall, and this is his first time navigating the St. Lawrence River in command of the Empress. Of the passengers, the lion's share of them are third class and steerage, 717 of them either re-immigrating back to Europe or returning to visit family. First class only had 87 passengers booked, and among them were a few notable names of the time. New Zealand's 3rd Mounted Regiment Colonel Robert Bloomfield, his wife Isabella, and their daughter Hilda, stage actor Lawrence Irving, and his wife and stage partner Mabel Hackney. Irving was the son of the famous Victorian stage actor Sir Henry Irving, and been on an extensive stage tour of Australia and North America since 1912. Another member was a former member of the British House of Commons, Sir Henry Seton Carr, who was returning home from a hunting trip in British Columbia. Henry Lyman, head of the largest pharmaceutical company in Canada in 1914, Lyman Sons and Company. He was bound for a much needed honeymoon with his wife, Florence. An associate editor for the Financial Times, Wallace Palmer, and his wife, Ethel. George Smart, who was the inspector of British immigrant children and receiving homes, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Tiley of the Canadian Army, and his wife, Martha Tiley. The second class was booked at just over half capacity with 170 people booked, a large group of them being members of the Salvation Army and their families. 
The Salvation Army members were traveling to London to attend the third International Salvation Army Congress. With all these people aboard Empress of Ireland, departed Quebec City for Liverpool on May 28, 1914 at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. During the early morning hours of May 29, 1914, Empress of Ireland approached Point au Pereire, where her pilot boat disembarked to head back to the harbor. Empress of Ireland resumed her normal outward course of 76 degrees. Soon, she sighted the mast headlights of SS Storstad that was approaching Quebec City, going the opposite direction as Empress of Ireland. SS Storstad was a single-funnel Norwegian collier, a collier being a bulk cargo ship designed to carry coal, and was roughly 440 feet in length, weighing in around 6,028 gross registered tons, a little under half the size of Empress of Ireland. SS Storstad approached the Empress on the starboard side, port side for the Storstad. Empress of Ireland and Storstad first noticed one another in clear weather conditions before fog swallowed both ships whole. Both ships repeatedly blew their fog whistles, signaling to one another in the darkness. At 1.56 in the morning, Storstad emerged from the fog at the starboard bow of the Empress, and it was unfortunately too late for either ship to change course. Before anyone could brace themselves, the bow of the Storstad slammed into the starboard side of the Empress of Ireland around midships with a deafening bang. Immediately after the collision, Captain Henry Kendall of the Empress called to the crew of the Storstad using a megaphone telling them to keep their engines at full power in order to plug the hole in the side of the ship. Although this was a solid plan, the Empress of Ireland was still moving forward, and the current of the St. Lawrence River sent SS Storstad drifting away out from the doomed liner after only five minutes of the ships in contact with one another, allowing over 60,000 gallons of water to begin rushing into the lower decks of Empress of Ireland. Within a few minutes, Empress of Ireland was listing starboard, and water settled toward the stern. Due to the watertight doors having to be manually closed, there is no time to close them. Because of this and open portholes at the waterline, water rushed in quickly and most of the passengers and crew members below the waterline or in the lower decks quickly drowned. Those that were housed in the upper decks immediately began to evacuate to the boat deck and load into lifeboats, the power going out five or six minutes after the impact, plunging everyone into darkness. Shortly after this, the ship's list was so severe that launching portside lifeboats became impossible. Scared passengers attempted to launch these boats, but they got caught on the hull of the ship and spilled their passengers into the cold water below. Five starboard lifeboats were successfully launched until the listing became too severe. The sixth boat launched capsizing and dumping the passengers into the water. Around 10 or 11 minutes after the collision, the ship lurched suddenly to the starboard side, allowing 700 scared passengers and crew to climb out of the open portholes and onto the port side of the ship. At this point, the survivors were standing on the port side hull of the ship as though it were the flat ground. The ship only stayed like this for a couple minutes, the iron groaning and creaking as water overtook her and pulled her under, sinking at 2.10 in the morning, roughly 14 minutes after colliding with SS Storstad. Her bow rose briefly as she sank by the stern before the Empress disappeared beneath the waves in a flurry of angry bubbles and wailing steel. Hundreds of scared people were now left stranded in the near-freezing water, resulting in the death of 1,012 people. There were only 465 survivors of the sinking of the Empress of Ireland. Four children, 41 women, 172 men, and 248 crew. Most passengers were asleep at the time of the sinking and weren't even awakened by the collision, making escape for them nearly impossible. Most of the drowned were from the starboard side, where the collision occurred. After the collision, SS Storstad remained afloat and was not in immediate danger, and began lowering her own lifeboats to rescue those in the water. A radio operator at Point Operaire, who had received an emergency signal from Empress of Ireland, had contacted two Canadian government steamers, Eureka and Lady Evelyn, both of whom turned en route to the site of the sinking. When Lady Evelyn arrived at 3.45 in the morning, there were no survivors left in the water, but 200 survivors that were on Storstad were transferred to Lady Evelyn, as well as 133 recovered bodies. Lady Evelyn and Storstad joined Eureka and Ramoski Wharf around 5.15 in the morning, 
Storstad continuing on to Quebec. One of the notable survivors was Captain Henry Kendall. He was on the bridge during the sinking, and as the Empress sank, he was thrown from the bridge and pulled underwater as the ship went under. He eventually broke the surface again and clung to a wooden grate until crew members in a lifeboat noticed him. Pulled him into the boat, pulled him into the lifeboat, and he immediately took control of the situation and began the rescue effort of others in the water around them. The crew of this boat successfully rescued many from the water, and when the boat was filled to capacity, Kendall ordered the crew to row to the Starstad to afloat the survivors. He and the other crew made a few more trips back to the wreckage, giving up after a couple hours since anyone else who was in the water would have surely drowned or died due to hypothermia at that point. Finally, after a harrowing at rescue effort, Captain Kendall returned to Storstad, being loaded into the collier. Furious and devastated, Captain Kendall stormed the bridge and shouted at the captain of the Storstad, You've sunk my ship. It's definitely understandable why he'd be so angry and he wasn't wrong. Shortly after the sinking, an inquiry was launched and newspapers reported from the inquiry at the time that if, quote, the testimony of both captains were to be believed, the collision happened as both vessels were stationary with their engines stopped, end quote. According to the Storstad, they were attempting to pass Empress of Ireland red to red, which means port to port, which was against regulation and still is. According to Empress of Ireland, they were attempting to pass green to green, or starboard to starboard, which is standard procedure. Due to the miscommunication and the conflicting directions, the two ships crashed into one another and the Empress ultimately sank. It is our firm belief that SS Storstad should be awarded with the lion's share of the blame in this disaster. Although we will not be relitigating the entirety of the inquiry into the sinking, we will sum it up for you. Ultimately, the inquiry found the same finding as us and fined the owners of SS Storstad $2 million to replace the Empress. SS Storstad ended up seized by the commission, being sold afterward for $175,000 to Prudential Trust, an insurance company who was acting on behalf of AF Claveness and Company, the shipping line that owned SS Storstad. SS Storstad was torpedoed and sunk later in 1917 during World War I. In the aftermath of the sinking on June 5, 1914, Canadian Pacific Steamship Company announced the chartering of the Allen Line ship Virginian to take RMS Empress of Ireland's place on the Liverpool to Canada route. She would join Empress of Ireland's remaining sister RMS Empress of Britain and the other ships acquired by the Canadian Pacific Steamship Company for this service between England and Canada. Virginian officially began running this service on June 12th of that year, embarking from Liverpool. June 12th, 1914, was the next service date for the Empress of Ireland, if she hadn't been sunk. So Eleanor, is there anything that could have been done to save the Empress and ensure that she would have been there for the June 12th voyage? Yes, actually. The ship ended up sinking so quickly because of three key points found by the inquiry. Number one, the Storstad hitting the Empress amidships. Number two, the failure to close the manual watertight doors and three, the longitudinal bulkheads that allowed cross-flooding, increasing the flow of water and hastening the sinking. Open portholes were also another factor that hastened the sinking. According to the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, known as SOLAS, it is required that all openable portholes be closed prior to disembarking. In 1914, in waters considered sheltered like the St. Lawrence River, portholes were often left open until they were closed at open sea. Due to this, water had more access points to come in. Luckily, nowadays, most portholes don't even open, and any that do have to be closed for the ship to leave port. Bow design was also changed after the sinking, removing the reverse prow shape of the bow, typical of most ocean liners at the time, since it was found to have worsened the sinking, making accidents like Empress of Ireland hopefully a thing of the past. The wreckage of Empress of Ireland was declared a site of historical and archaeological importance in 1999 by the Canadian government and is registered as a historical site of Canada. This is important because Empress of Ireland rests only 130 feet under the water, well within diving distance and the government was worried about thieves and vandalism. The dive is only meant for skilled divers, however. Due to the cold waters and strong currents that has taken the lives of at least six divers as of 2009. So please, dear listeners, 
Do not attempt to dive the Empress of Ireland wreckage. This dive is meant for skilled dive masters. Last week, we talked about MV Wilhelm Gustloff and its unfortunate affiliation with Titanic due to its high death toll. Just as that is disrespectful, the nickname for the Empress as the Canadian Titanic is disgusting, deplorable, and completely undermines the loss of the Empress of Ireland. So please, fellowship enthusiasts, let this nickname become a thing of the past. The victims of RMS Empress of Ireland and the victims of RMS Titanic deserve their own separate representation and acknowledgement in order to bring light to both disasters instead of distracting from one using the other. This episode hopes to commemorate the memories of those lost on the Empress of Ireland and to keep her story relevant. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you like this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the infamous RMS Lancastria, a Cunard ocean liner that sank during World War II and is estimated to be the largest single vessel disaster in British maritime history. Don't forget to check out our sister podcast, Slasher Saturday. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.